<laughs> so before we continue with that, I just need to say that this is the discussion on chapter two of Dr. Jacqueline Bussey's book, Outlaw Christian. Um, and we are just getting started talking about first impressions of chapter two and hearing people's reaction. Barbara, you were going to say something more about how it made you realize you were angry more often than you thought you were. Well, angry is probably a strong word. And that's what she uses. But uh, unhappy with situations is probably more where I, where I would be at. But there's a lot of things that I have often wondered, why did God do what he did, particularly in the, in the Old Testament? And yep. things today that happen that I see that I wonder why he lets these things happen. And we discussed it last week, such, such as children that are ill. It's, that's all very hard for me to understand why we have these things. God was testing Job's faith in him. Yeah. Um, I mean, right now in confirmation, we're going through the Old Testament. So I've got a fifth grader, a sixth grader, and a tenth grader. Um, and trying to explain to them, you know, how the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. Because when you look at the two, we understand God radically different in the New Testament than we did in the Old Testament. And so I end up explaining repeatedly that it is the same God, and it is a God that God is a God of love. Um, we just have to see our way through the filter of, of what's there. Um, so this first chapter is taking apart that first rule that we had discussed, that first law. So never get mad at God. Anger at the Almighty is blasphemy. What do you what do you think when you hear that? Hogwash. Because for me as an example, when I found out I had the five brain tumors, I was like, God, how could you do that to me? I had so much to do and, you know, but then I went back, I think he put me in that hospital room for that little baby girl that was in the room with me for me to comfort her. Well, so Stephen's in a better place than we are, or some of us are. Um, who's ever been taught that you should never get mad at God? I don't know. But I don't think anybody has ever actually said those words as much as we assumed it. Yeah, Maybe some of it. Some of it is just assumed theology. Um. It also depends on your tradition, right? Because Rosie raised her hand because having been raised in the Pentecostal holiness tradition, it's very much a, a, a factor there is that you cannot and should not get mad at God because God always wants the best for you. And how dare you get mad at God? Do you think God tests us by doing that, our faith? I think God is represented in the Bible as testing people. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly what it was. I'm not sure that that's not a representation of them having gotten mad at God and tried to rationalize it out. Um, because at the end of the day, humans wrote the Bible. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but our own stuff ends up in the Bible quite often. Um I have a problem with the idea of, of God, like, springing things on people to test them. Just because it doesn't match up very well with what Jesus did. Um, well, it, go ahead. 
it, it's it's hard to believe that I do believe it, but it's hard to believe that God is the same God in the Old Testament as the New Testament. Yeah, he seems is. so much more lovable. This Job thing, why did he destroy his family? If he was if he was testing Job, which it seemed he was allowing the Satan to test him, why did he you know, that's tremendous. To me, I, that's yeah. the kind of thing that I just have trouble with. So this is a, a good example of something we need to remember about Scripture, right? So we like to think that Scripture speaks with one unified voice, okay? Like everybody got together at a convention and wrote down all this stuff and figured it all out, right? And the reality is it's just not true, okay? The books of the Bible were written at different times by different people in different places with different situations, okay? And the book of Job represents a very different view of God and Satan than do most other books in the Bible, okay? Because it presents Satan as this tester of faith who has this kind of chummy relationship with God who, you know, they're just like joking around and like, yeah, sure, you could test my servant Job. Sure, that's no big deal. Kill off his family and everything. It'll be fine. You know, which is not the God that we think of when we think of God. Okay. And it's not who we think of when we think of Satan. Um, the book of Job exists to make a point, um, just like the book of Ruth does. You know, we just covered Ruth in confirmation. And the purpose of the book of Ruth is to show the importance of trusting God and, and being led by somebody, okay? Having trust in someone. The book of Job is there to teach us about relationship with God, right? And how it is essentially okay, because she makes a good point here that a lot of us have misinterpreted Job. You know, somehow we came out with this idea of, of patient Job who who waits for God to, to relent and everything. And that's, if you read the book, that's not what Job does. Job is not a happy person this entire thing. He's, he's yelling at God. He's raging at God, you know? And God does ultimately seem a little annoyed at one point, but ultimately... He sets things right. You know, now I would argue that it's still not completely right because you didn't put my life back the way it was. And I was perfectly happy with the way it was. But I think Job at that point had figured he'd pushed his luck too far and he was going to be quiet. Um, so what point is the book of Job making? I, I've missed. The point is that it's the it's about your relationship with God and the fact that it's not wrong to be upset with God. That's one of the points of Job, right? Okay, you can rage at God. You can demand to know why God has done something. It's perfectly okay to do those things. You know, it's also perfectly okay to listen for the response from God. Okay, because this is an extreme example of, of why these things have happened. But the reality is, you know, in our world, you're not going to have God who's, who's testing you like this. Okay. But it still teaches us to be able to rage at God and to listen for God's answer once we're done. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, let's see. So if you look at page 17, she talks about in the second paragraph there, she says, these worries frighten me for sure, but they no longer clutch me in their stranglehold of silence and secrecy the way they once did. Why not? Because something frightens me far more. Living a life of faith 
that is fake and inauthentic. Silence, like every form of dishonesty, is life destroying. I'm scared to death of getting to the end of my life and discovering that my faith was a charade and something I never really owned, like my dad's lease car that disappeared back to the dealer's lot one day when he could no longer afford the payments. In my experience, only faith that is unafraid to ask the toughest questions can survive the toughest times. So I bring that up because a lot of people look at pastors and think, oh, you know, you must have to have like really good faith to be a pastor, right? I mean, surely they test you on that kind of thing and, and you know, verify that you're a great and faithful person and this, that, and the other, right? Um, and in a way they do, right? They, you know, that's part of the candidacy process. So they, they want to know about your faith journey as you come into the entrance process. They want to hear how you've grown when you go through the second meeting with them, which is endorsement. And then um, when you get there for, for approval, which is the last step of candidacy, um, you have to be able to articulate a, a Lutheran theology that you truly believe that you see in your life, right? But all of that is high class language that doesn't actually get to the root of, of what faith is. It is perfectly possible to parrot Lutheran theological things and make a cohesive argument in front of a committee that will get you approved without believing any of it. Okay, you just have to say the right words. Um, and there are people who have done that, who have gotten through and and <laughs> gone on to become pastors that have done damage to the church. Um, it's just a reality of our of our structure and any church's structure. It's hard to test what someone's faith is like, okay? Because the only thing that can really do that is a crisis in your life. Okay? When you have something that happens that really makes you ask the tough questions, really makes you wonder why this has happened and and lose some of that happy-go-lucky faith that we often have so often, or that we have so often, which says that that God loves us and wants the best for us, and you know, lends itself to the to the prosperity gospel. If you send Creflo Dollar a hundred dollars, he'll God will <laughs> bless you with a thousand more in a jet plane, right? Um, Does that have, why so many evangelists or? millionaires yeah it is and actually if you want to know more about that um I, i'm going to say a word that may scare you but there are these things called podcast okay? podcast podcast don't run away okay <laughs> podcast are something that are available on your phone or online and it is like listening to the radio but it is a specific topic um, and it's a pre-recorded conversation. NPR's uh, history podcast called Throughline just did a special on the prosperity gospel and how those mega rich pastors got to where they were by essentially preying on the faith of others. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a, it was a, I listened to it on my way back from Columbia yesterday. It was a really interesting podcast um, and, and explain some of the stuff that I didn't understand about that. So I recommend that if you have a minute. Um, anyway, so when we have these crises, right, that really make us question our faith, and it might be the death of a loved one. It might be when it seems like everything's falling apart because you've lost your job um, or, you know, you've lost friends or whatever really a heart strickening crisis you might find yourself in. And you start asking these questions. That's when you learn more about your faith. 
but we get scared by those questions. And so we try to hide behind a screen of the happy faith, right? That God loves us. God wants the best for us. God wouldn't do anything to hurt us. Um, and we don't engage in those tough questions. We run away from them because we're afraid on some subconscious level, a lot of the time that God will get mad at us. If we start digging too deep, if we start, you know, getting too aggressive. When I first started ministry, I was, I was still like that. You know, I was, and you, I can see it in my sermons and stuff. You know, I wouldn't ask those hard questions a lot of the time because, you know, I didn't, I, I'm still new to this and I'm trying to get in the groove and I, I want to carry these people with me and, and help them hear God's grace and good news and, and, you know, God's love and, and all this. And if I get in there and start asking hard questions, they're not going to like me and, you know, the whole nine yards, right? I've come past that now, um, partly as a result of all the deaths that we've had between the congregations and having to do funeral upon funeral upon funeral um, that had me asking those hard questions. Um, partly because of dealing with people who have sudden illnesses that are just, there's no other way to describe them, but unfair. Because, you know, these are people who have given their whole lives over to something and now all of a sudden they're being attacked by something and it's, it's just not fair. Um, people who have conditions that have degraded what they're able to do and who are, who I, I get to sit with as they try to reason that out and figure out how that's going to change their worship experience and what they offer to the church and, and things like that. You know, all those things with the way that I care about you all affect me too and make me ask of those hard questions as well, which is why I've, I've said before, if you ever walk into one of the churches and you hear somebody in the sanctuary shouting, don't come in because that's probably me having it out with God. Um, because it happens. Sometimes that's just the way I feel. Sometimes I just have to go in there and demand to know why this is happening. You know, why would you do this to this person? Why would you allow this to happen? Why would you not let somebody have the ability to fix this? And honestly, because of that, because of asking those questions, over the last few years, my faith has gotten stronger. Um, you would think the opposite would be true, or at least we're conditioned to think the opposite would true would be true. We almost think that if we demand to know things of God and if we argue with God, that we're going to end up with a lesser faith, not believing in God. But the reality is, if you truly do have those arguments with God and then listen for the answers and are open to hear what God is saying and what and see what God is doing, then it does strengthen your faith because you see the problem, but you also see the response. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. While I'm looking for the next thing I wanted to say, does anybody have any thoughts right now? Anything they want to say? Any questions or comments? All right. So Flip over to page 18, if you're able to look at it. Um, 
she starts talking about how you feel isolated and alone when you start asking these questions at first. Um, and there in the, let's see, one, two, the third paragraph down there at the end of it, she says, you feel alone not because you really are alone, but because of the nasty unwritten faith law that demands we keep such sinful thoughts secret and hidden from each other. Um, do y'all remember me ever sharing with you that I went to Bishop school years ago? Mm -mm. So yeah. if, if you, if you don't remember Bishop school is something that the, I think they still do. I, I don't know. So many things have ended over the last few years that I couldn't tell you anymore, but, uh, region nine in particular, which is, a uh, is the region we're in and includes, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, um, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, if I didn't say that one, and then the Florida Bahamas. So it's a really large region, okay? We are a net producer of candidates for ministry, um, which means that for a long time, before they changed how the call process was done, we typically produced more people who went to seminary and got their MDiv or their MAR and became either pastors or deacons than did any other region in the church. Okay. And so a lot of our candidates did not stay here. They got sent to like region one, which is the Pacific Northwest, um, where they have a hard time finding candidates, or they got sent to Region 3, which is the Midwest, especially the, the upper Midwest. So, you know, places like Minnesota, the Dakotas, places where there's a lot of little tiny Lutheran churches that are way spaced out because they're in these tiny little farming communities. And so it, none of them have the money for a full-time pastor. And you have like six point parishes um yeah so that kind of thing right um but we would do a, a thing called bishop school every few years because we were a net producer of candidates and so they wanted to start identifying candidates early and so the senate would partner or well the senate of region nine would partner with the seminary and one of the region nine bishops would come down to the seminary for a week and kids from all over the region would come to the seminary and get a chance to just kind of experience seminary life and faith life on a larger scale. So we went to, we, we were based out of the seminary, but we got to sit in on some seminary classes. Unfortunately, both those professors retired before I made it to the seminary, but you know, whatever. That's how long it took for me to get there. Um, uh, and then we got to go to um, to Mepkin Abbey um, and and worship with the, the people at the monastery there. Um, they did not tell me going in that they were vegetarian, so I was very unhappy with my salad. Um, but, you know, whatever. Um, we got to go downtown Charleston and go to St. Matthew's and St. John's and tour those those churches since they're so historic and important. Um, and we just all kinds of things, right? So like the next to last night, I remember us having a worship service in Christ Chapel. And it was a really kind of emotional service. And it had been very much a discipleship themed service. And, and basically they were asking the question, are you going to answer the call? You know, if you really feel it, are you going to answer the call? And I remember that after the worship service, most people didn't leave. They kind of hung around the chapel and just kind of soaked it in and, and then that started leading to some conversations. And then people started getting a little 
upset and you know there's a lot of doubts and and are you hearing a call and just the whole nine yards right because there's they're they're putting a, a good bit of pressure on teenagers who you know already have a lot going on at that point I and mean, remember this is just, this is the generation that got to witness 9-11 from our classrooms right so it wasn't exactly a, a great time to do that um but I remember standing in the pulpit at in the chapel and thinking, like thinking out loud to a couple of my friends that I just did not see a path forward where I would actually be able to become a pastor. Okay. And that was for two reasons. One, it was because I didn't think my faith was strong enough. Okay. Two, because I couldn't see a way that I would ever have the money. To pay. Okay. Because they had been very upfront with us about what the price of seminary was. And even back then, it wasn't cheap. It got, it got worse before I got there. But they were very upfront about what the price was. And the seminary was very upfront about the fact that there weren't a lot in the way of scholarships. And back then... They were telling you, you were going to have to take loans and you were going to have to take big loans um, because, you know, then student loans were the answer to everything, um, which is why so many people are in trouble now with debt. Um, and I remember the people, the friends that I had were like, oh, no, you're going to you're going to be fine. I'm going to come to your ordination. It's going to be here. and It's going to be great. And everything's going to be fine. And that and the other and I don't think any of them ever got ordained. I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. Certainly none of them came to my ordination, um, but that was also during COVID time. So like nobody was able to come to my ordination, um, except Bonnie. Bonnie got to go. And Cheryl. Um, yeah, and Cheryl. Um, but it took a really long time to get past that feeling of, of um, my faith not being worthy enough, right? Like not having a, a strong enough faith. And a lot of it was because I was doing the things she describes in here. I felt alone. I felt like, you know, I was the only one dealing with this kind of crisis, which is ridiculous because everybody deals with it. And I felt like I couldn't really engage in a real conversation with God because, you know, how, how do you bring up your insignificant issues to the almighty? You know, <laughs> why do you expect that God's got to pay you any attention or care? Right. Um, and I struggled with that for a really long time. You know, even once I finally got to the point where I was willing to say the words, I think I want to go to seminary to Rosie of all people. I expected her to laugh at me. Um, I expected the pastor at Trinity when I told him to laugh at me. To be fair, some people did. Um, and probably still would. <laughs> but you know they saw something in me that I didn't see right so when we're going through these crises of faith there's one thing that she doesn't cover very well in here and that's the fact that you know we're not alone other people have experienced these as well okay um and so if we are serious about being a community of believers, okay, a community of disciples, then we should also be willing to be at least somewhat open with others within our church family. Um, not just me, the pastor, but also others within the church, because we should be going through these faith struggles together. That's 
part of what God instituted the church for was to be a, an element of mutual support for people who call themselves disciples. When we aren't able to come together and talk about these things is when the faith crises become worse. Okay, because then we feel cut off and isolated even from our own community. And that's when things get really hard, because then you've made yourself alone. What are your thoughts about that? Does that make sense to you? or I think it does, because I had a very good support system in our church. And friends and family and it really did help see I, I think both christ community and saint michael are unique in your own way in that the the bonds that tie members together are stronger in those two churches than in most places okay Part of it is from being a, being small communities, right? You know, there's always going to be a more familial bond in a smaller church than there is in, say, a, a big church where there's multiple services and you don't know who comes to the second service. You don't worry about the second service. You just worry about your service. Um, but in, in St. Michael's case, y'all went through a period where you didn't have a pastor you didn't have any kind of real spiritual leadership, and it fell on y'all to figure it out. And what you did was you came together for the most part. There are a couple of people who had some interesting opinions, but you came together for the most part, and you 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 learned to walk those paths by yourselves, okay, as a group. And I think that makes my job a little bit easier when I, when I have to, when we have these crises in the church, right? But it also makes it a little bit harder for me because y'all are more likely to call each other to tell each other about something that's going on before you call me, if you call me at all. <coughs> Half the time I find out from somebody else who heard it from somebody else who heard it from somebody else. Um, at Christ Community, it's similar, but it's because of a different reason. It's because y'all went through the the kind of the trauma of closing down peace and creating Christ community and then all the stuff with with Sherry and then all the stuff with with trying to recover from that. And yeah. So it's been a long and then the termites, you know, it's been a long road. <laughs> so I mean, if the termites had just come in and told us they had a problem, if we could have worked with them, they didn't have to eat our wood. So. All right. Sorry, my back's hurt. All right. So where are y'all at? What are your thoughts? Is there anything in this chapter that you want to talk more about or that I haven't talked about and under the um hope anger and courage which is on what page? i never thought about anger yeah. <laughs> hope until i read that yep um i mean we our society is is kind of conditioned to to think anger is a bad thing right, right. you know i I found myself spending a lot of time telling Lexi that it is okay to have emotions, right? Um, I do have to fuss at her sometimes when the emotions get overwhelming, like when she freaked out at the zoo because she was scared of a bee and she traumatized the flamingo so badly that they almost flew away. Um you know, or the time that she freaked out at the zoo because of another bee and traumatized the prairie dog so badly they haven't come out of their whole sense. Um, 
You know, that was that was a bit excessive. There was no need to scream like that. But it is okay to be scared. It is okay to be angry. Is it okay to be upset? You know, we we tend to, as a society, try to force people not to feel the way they feel or to hide the way they feel if it's something we've categorized as a negative emotion. You know, so we say it's not okay to be angry. It's not okay to be scared. You know, and the reality is, is it is. Because where did those emotions come from? Who gave us those emotions? God gave them to us. Right. And so God's not going to give us something that God doesn't intend us to have a use for. We see that clearly in our ministries. God equips us for what we need to do. And so God has given us those emotions. So clearly God intends us to use those emotions, even when they're directed back at God. What else? Well, what about the anger is honesty? Yeah. Um, particularly in that in that section is when she talks about how depression is anger turned inward. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's very true. Um, we we have a tendency to to, to beat ourselves up and yeah. Um, it's okay to be honest. It's okay to be angry. Let it out. You'll feel better. You know. I used that a long, long time ago when we had friends, close friends I've been friends with for years that left our church, and I couldn't understand. I was just angry over it. Yeah. But I kept it to myself. Now, I wonder, I honestly wonder how much church conflict and, and heartbreak and stuff in the church would be mitigated if we were just willing to talk to each other and express our emotions. You know? I don't think it's just talking to one another as much as listening to the other person. We yeah. all have our own thoughts and beliefs, and do we really listen to what the other person is telling us? Yep. That and being honest. Because too often we we say things that we think somebody wants to hear rather than the things that we should say. You really feel. Um, and she's right at the, the bottom of page 22. She says that God wants to know everything that is really going on with you, all your deepest thoughts and fears and idiosyncrasies and worries. You know, we we confess every Sunday that God is our heavenly father. Right. We say it in the creeds. We say it in the Lord's prayer. We lift it up when we have communion when we talk about you know the when we talk about when we bless the elements and everything you know we say god is our father and we should be able just like my daughter should be able to come to me and talk to me about anything at any time for any reason without me pulling a lightning bolt So, too, should we children be able to go to God, our Father, and talk to God about anything at any time? And not just should we be able to, but we should be willing to, trusting that God loves us and wants to hear from us and will hear us for what we actually say and what our hearts say. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jacqueline. There you go. I was going to ask if you could mute for a second. 
Um, so we've talked a little bit before about being a biblical outlaw, right? And some of you said that you were a bit uncomfortable with that idea. Um, but in the back section of this chapter, she lifts up biblical outlaws in a couple different places, right? She talks about the psalmist as an outlaw, and she particularly highlights Psalm 44. So, you know, because of you, we are being killed all day long and accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Rouse yourself. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Awake. Do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? You know, that is a clear example of somebody who is angry and yelling at God and saying, and, it, and it's in scripture, right? You know, somebody is being quite honest. Then she brings up, I've never been able to say that name right. It's got, it doesn't even, it's not, the way the English is rendered does not even do it justice in Hebrew. It's it's a really weird pronunciation in Hebrew, but Koleth or something like that. Um, so the writer of Ecclesiastes, right? Again, I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun. Look, the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who have already died more fortunate than the living who were still alive, but better than both is the one who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. That person straight up just said you were better off if you had never even been born. You know? And then you have Job, who is, you know, an example unto himself. So the point of raising those, those three both for her and for me, is to say that I hope you are becoming a little bit more comfortable with the idea of, of being a biblical outlaw or a faith outlaw in this sense, in that it means to be willing to ask those hard questions and be willing to show your true emotions to God. Because if people could do it in scripture itself and if we we seriously do believe that god created us and gave us the emotions that we have then there's no reason why we should try to hide anything and even if we did try to hide anything god already knows our hearts god knows us better than we know ourselves god knows how many hairs are upon our body you know and so i guarantee you that even if we try to hide it god already knows and god's probably going what you, why are you trying to hide that? You know, do you really think you're going to get around me? So I'm going to leave it there and then let y'all ask any questions or, or bring up anything that I haven't covered that you want to talk about still. Or ask for clarification on anything that I rambled about and you don't know what I was talking about. Because I'm sure I never do that. <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, I've often thought, and, and I do believe that God knows what's going on in my life. And I've often thought that he knows what I'm thinking. Mm. And what I'm thinking a lot of times is nothing near what I'm saying. Yeah. So he... He, he he's probably disappointed in my thoughts. Uh, you probably think I'm outspoken, but really I hold a lot in. Not so, you. Yeah, I kind of figured you did actually. Yeah. Um. So so a couple things there, right? Um. You know. One, I, I think that God, God does know our hearts, just like we said, okay? But I think sometimes that can become an excuse for us, okay? We 
almost get to a point where we say, oh, God knows what's going on with us. God knows our hearts. So I don't need to say this out loud. I don't need to bring this up in a prayer. God knows. God will take care of it. God knows. God knows how I'm feeling. But there's value to to addressing things in your prayers, to saying them out loud, to owning the way you feel. Okay? Because it makes you think, it makes you curious, and it makes you listen for that response from God. Okay? So I would encourage everybody to, to be intentional about that and to, to really bring up those emotions and those questions to God when you feel them, rather than just supposing that God, you know, gets it automatically. Um, as far as God being disappointed in what we hold back, um, you know, in the, in, at least in thinking that, or at least being disappointed in the bad thoughts that we have that we don't express out loud, um, I mean, maybe, but I also don't think God's monitoring us 24 hours a day to like the morality police to see if we're getting angry with somebody or saying, you know, thinking something and saying another, right? You know, we do need to remember that God is not the the traffic cop hiding behind a bush waiting to get us. Okay? God is there for us and knows us, but is not like... You're not on camera. Does that make sense? Well, that's another reason why we should be expressing ourselves in our prayers. Yeah. Rather than assuming he knows what we need. Yeah. And I mean, believe me, everybody has an inner monologue in their mind that that says something a little bit different than what they express because... We have rules of society for polite conversation and we internalize things and keep some things inside us. And, and I'm no different in that regard than anybody else. Okay. You know, so don't beat yourself up too bad. So when I'm saying my prayers in the morning or at night and I'm thinking and I say, Bless the people of Ukraine and be with them while they're going through this difficult time. I can't even imagine what it's like for them. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, if somebody would just shoot Putin and get rid of him. But my mind, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is please change his heart. Right. Um, so it's kind of like a, a battle. Well, and I wonder if, I think the unspoken God question there, because let's just say there's behind an emotion that, you know, if something were just fix this problem, it would go away. There's a, there's a God question there, okay? And that question is, God, why are you allowing this tyrant to exist and to inflict this horrific, fight on these people who didn't do anything to him okay why are you letting this happen and so maybe that's a question you need to ask in your prayers you know and and bring that god question to the fore well i deal with the i have problems dealing with the term god lets this happen right uh, and, and it, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> well, I, I really don't know what I'm trying to say, but I believe he, right or wrong, I believe he lets these things happen when he could stop. So that leads me to feel, why did you let this thing happen? Right. Which is, is, leads to anger, to the anger that is in this outlaw, Christian outlaw book whatever this title is outlaw yeah. christian i guess outlaw christian uh, well, I, I think there's nothing wrong with that anger though um because it is just the simple reality of the world that god is good and so and god is all-powerful and created the world so if god wanted to 
God could snap his fingers and all hurting and suffering and sin and everything else would fall away. And so it's a legitimate question and a legitimate anger to ask why God hasn't done that already. It's one that I ask whenever something upsetting happens to one of you all, or whenever I have something going on in my life that I can't understand. Why? How long, O oh Lord? You know, you sent Jesus to show us a way of be of coexisting. Well, we obviously have not coexisted very well. So how much longer is this charade going to go on? What your else? Back is an example. Why is he letting your back hurt like that when you're trying to serve him? That, that, that's a good example. Well, and there's there's more examples than that. You know, the the person who taught me confirmation when I was in middle school. You know, when I got ordained, I got access to the clergy directory. And so I looked her up and found out she had died two years after I moved down to Andrews of cancer. You know, she was mm -hmm. serving God and she just was gone. You know, and so that's definitely a why did this happen kind of thing. I guess the point of what Jacqueline Bussey is saying here is running from those questions and running from that anger that, in, that it generates is the wrong approach. You know, it's okay to have one of those complicated relationships with God, okay? Because if we truly believe, as Luther taught us, that we are saved by grace through faith, then having a complicated relationship with God is not going to keep us from, from salvation. We've already gotten that. Okay. But it is going to leave us with a list of questions to ask God when we get there. I have a long, long list. <laughs> <laughs> What other thoughts do you have? Questions, comments, concerns, smart remarks? Well, I, I was going to say that, you know, good, good things and bad things fall on the just and the unjust. Yep. You know, it falls on the believers and the unbelievers because of the sinful world that we're in. Yep. And you want to, and of course, people make mistakes. You know, they do things to themselves, you know, but you're, you're still wondering why things bad, why bad things happen, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. I guess because none of us are good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yourself. Speak for yourself, girl. <laughs> what What do you think about that, Pastor? I don't have the answer. We're not I good. I um, yeah, we're I, not. We're not good. Well, so the argument would be that. The theological argument would be God created everything to be good, okay, including us. As a matter of fact, in Genesis, when God creates humanity, God says that this is very good. Um, we don't live up to that as much as we should, um, but a lot of that is our choices more than anything else. You know, we can choose to do good or we can choose to do bad. Um, it's not going to change the randomness of the world because the randomness of the world is caused by somebody who chose to do bad. Um, you know, sometimes bad things happen. But rather than being deterred by that or throwing our hands up and saying it is what it is, we'll just have to figure it out. We can dedicate ourselves to doing as good a job as we can and hoping that that makes a dent in the crazy of the world. You know, because all we can strive for is trying to bring what God has promised us into our reality now. You know, and if we can do a little bit of that, we will have improved the world vastly. 
And, and you're thinking, well, where is God in all this mess? But he's right with you in spirit. Yep. Amen. Yep. All right. So it's 803. Final comments, questions, concerns. All right. John, are you up for a uh, phone call after this? Yes, he stepped away from the computer, but he'd be good with that. Yes. Okay. You want me to call the house or a cell phone? Call the house. Okay. All right. So I'll call you all right after we get off here. Thank you. All right. All right. Hearing no other questions, comments, or concerns, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, God. Thanks be to God. Peace, everybody. Peace. Peace. We'll see y'all on Sunday. All right. All righty. Bye. 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 Thank you. Hey. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.